So this morning, the Word of God is focusing on the text from John chapter 5, where it, it reads, I want us, my wife, you can put a place up on the PowerPoint, I'm sorry, the screen, verses uh, 7, I'm sorry, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. And when Jesus saw them lying down there and learned that there had been, he had been in the condition for a long time, he asked a question, do you want to get well? Verse 7, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. And when, when the water is stirred, when I am trying to get in, someone else goes ahead of me. In verse 8, then Jesus said, get up, get up, pick your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured and he picked up his mat and walked. The sermon title this morning is Asking Questions About Health. Asking Questions About Health. While I was preparing for the sermon, I was thinking about this month being Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And this month is a month where we usually wear pink to remember all those brave women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer and have survived. I know a lot of women who have survived this type of cancer. But unfortunately, I know of some women who have not survived, who have transitioned into eternal life. I remember my late mentor, shared with me that his wife was battling breast cancer and eventually she died in the year 2012. <clears throat> but there's also something that I've learned about life that as we age, we must learn how to ask questions about life. When I was young and energetic, I was not thinking about my health. But now, as we turn 70 and whatever and 60, health becomes critical. Health is wealth. Amen? Amen? I did not think about the day when I was younger, when I would have an abundancy of doctor's appointments. <clears throat> that is becoming a part of my life now, where I have to remember to write doctor's appointments on my calendar. Because the longer we live, we understand the importance of health. The longer we live, the more hopeful that we become about our problems. I have a dear friend of whom I met with this week for, lun uh, for lunch. And you know, our American tradition, we always ask, People, how are you? But we not really are not listening when people spoke, speak. So I asked my friend, how are you? And he mumbled, my brother died. And I just kept on moving. Praise the Lord. But in reality, I needed to slow it down. Because my friend had just told me his brother died. And he told me that my brother died suddenly. And he said, if only my brother had asked the right questions, if only my brother had spoken to his family and let his family know that he was sick, we could do a much better, effective job of giving him a proper burial. And then he said to me, he says, my brother is gone now, Pastor Glenn. And now we're struggling trying to give my brother a decent burial. And he says, you know, the burial cost almost $16,000. But he said he died in Florida, so they have a double expense. Because the mortician 
in Florida is also charging because the body is de decomposing and the body has to be embalmed. And because of the hurricane that hit hard in Florida, they, it was a delay. And he said, all of this is costing money. Funerals require us to ask questions. Funerals require us to realize that we're here for a moment, but with an instant of a vapor, we can disappear from this thing called life. I noted that my friend was asking questions about his brother's health, but it was too late. His brother was gone. Asking questions about your health is so important as you live. The importance of having a healthy body is very, very important. We must learn how to preserve our health. We're made up of body, mind, and spirit. And if one part of the body fails, it affects the total body. Hello, somebody. We have to take care of ourselves Spiritually, we have to take care of our mental health, too. Hello, somebody. We have to take care of our bodies, learning to eat proper foods. I hope we're going to have some healthy food when we leave. <laughs> we're going to have some healthy African food when we finish here. But food and diet, as your pastor, uh, interim pastor, loves to do, is eat. The body is a fragile part of living. When we do not listen to our bodies, we, pr we pay for it. Hello, somebody. When we do not take good care of our health and ask questions about our health, in the words of George Bernard Shaw, life becomes wasted. Bernard Shaw was talking about being young, when we're young, we don't quite understand the importance of life. We don't quite know what to do with life. But as we live a little while and we gain wisdom, then we start having all these things about life. But you know, when I was preparing this sermon, I was thinking about not only do we need healthy bodies, but we need healthy churches also. We need churches that have a healthy sense of who they are. Whoever the leader of a church is, that leader must model healthy living and healthy choices for people. A healthy church is a church that is spiritually focused. A healthy church is a church that knows that it's not about me, myself, and I, but the church is about God. The church has as the heart of its mission the words of Jesus that tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I did some research this week. I did some research. According to Pew Research Center, which published a report on October the 17th, 2019, the United States of America is on a decline when it comes to Christianity. I did not know this. 65% of American adults describe themselves as Christians, but that does not mean that they identify with a particular church, organized, as we call it, organized religion. There are many people who questions, who have questions about organized religion as being unhealthy. Unhealthy because according to research, this is interesting too, when I was researching for the sermon, I learned that over 80% of people are saying that nobody has ever invited them to church. I'm like, wow. We don't invite people. We go to church by ourselves. We never think about inviting a friend, inviting someone to come with us. How do you think this church is going to grow? We've got to invite people to come. Hello, somebody. 
We've got to go back to this invitation of being an inviting church. Unfortunately, our churches are filled with people who have not been healed. Churches are loaded with toxic people. Churches are loaded with people who sometimes want to be controlling and, and manipulative and use the church as a form of supporting their own agenda. The church does not exist for your agenda. The church exists for God's agenda. It's not about your agenda. It's about what are we going to do for God. And so that's where prayer comes in to ministry. The more we pray, the more we fast, the more we can be in tune with what God wants to do for this time and this present age. There's a generation, we call them Generation Z, who are people who are not impress with coming to church. I mingle with Generation Z all the time, and I find that some of them are deeply spiritual, and I ask, why don't you go to church? And they said, well, you know. And then there are those who come. The church has to be in a, an analysis mode now. We've got to analyze what are we doing? Why are we doing what we do? I picked up Marvin McMickle's book this week. Marvin McMickle has a, a great book called Where Have All the Prophets Gone? And Dr. McMickle is acknowledging that the church used to be the voice, the mouthpiece of God. But now the church is silent. The church does not speak prophetically anymore. According to Peter Gomes, a great theologian, he says, there, is not, there are no Christians in John's gospel. And so what we see here in this text, in John chapter 5, we're seeing Jesus coming into a place, into a pool that is loaded with sick people. He's coming to a location, if you can bring the, the screen up with John chapter 5, verse 1. It shows us that Jesus is coming into a place where everybody is sick. Go to verse 2. The interesting thing about the Gospel of John is that Bible scholars argue that John's Gospel is not a synoptic Gospel. John is believed to be one of the unique writings of the Bible. Bible scholars believe that the Gospel of John does not fit into the synoptic Gospel tradition. Mark, Matthew, and Luke are the synoptic Gospels. But John seems to come into a different perspective. John is believed to be one of the what is called by Bible scholars one of the most spiritual gospels in the New Testament. We see in John's gospel that John is wrestling with this fancy thing called Christology. John is wrestling with where did God come from and where did Jesus come from? And he starts off in chapter 1 that says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God And then he says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. John's gospel is so interesting. John's gospel is where we have the I am sayings, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate and the shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the vine and the truth. But what's happening in John's gospel, and we're seeing it very clearly here in the fifth chapter of John, is that John is arguing that there ought to be a change. He comes to this pool, and, and Jesus is looking at all these sick people, and Jesus is wondering, why are they here? Why are they stuck in a pool? 
Church, sometimes we get stuck. Sometimes we get stuck in the way it used to be. I, now, don't get me wrong. I, I know what I'm talking about. I've pastored three churches, and I've learned that churches often get stuck in the mud of the glory days, of the way it used to be. And, and the problem with that theology is it's not relevant to where the world is for now. Hello, somebody. I'm, I'm just interim on my way out. On my way out, Pastor Dick. Trying to help the church to understand that it's more about understanding what the focal point of the church is all about. At the heart of the church is that we must embrace change. These folk were sitting around the pool for uh, all these years, and they knew that they, if they could just get out of the pool and if the angel would touch them, they would experience change. Jesus is walking, approaching the pool called the Sheep Gate, which is located near the temple prior to the destruction of the temple which happened in 70 AD. You know, the temple was destroyed twice, once by the Babylonians, and then the temple was destroyed by the Romans. Jerusalem was the holy city that was sandwiched between Passover feasts and the Feast of the Booths. It is interesting that we've lived through our Jewish, with our Jewish friends, two sacred holidays. Rosh Hashanah, the day that is supposed to be a day of shouting and rejoicing. And I don't know about you, but most of my Jewish friends told me that they could not shout in jo- with joy because of what's happening in, their ho- in, in the Middle East right now. It was, a, it was a moment of lamenting and mourning. But it's supposed, Rosh Hashanah is supposed to be a day of rejoicing. It's the new year for the Jewish community. And then comes Yom Kippur, which began on Friday night. And Minister Tina actually brought it up in our Friday night prayer moment that this is a sacred day for the Jewish community. Yom Kippur ended on yesterday. It's a high holy day for Jews as Jews spend this day in reflection and prayer and fasting as the day of atonement. What questions do you have about your health? In the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 1, it acknowledges that we can be healed if we just learn how to ask the right question. Jesus asked this man, do you want to be well? Do you want to get out of this rut? Do you want to experience wholeness and healing? I can imagine this man was even surprised that Jesus would ignore, because he he was not the only one that was in that pool. There was a whole lot of folks in there. And they're all kind of wiggling through this pool, and they have been in there for different times. But Jesus focuses here on John chapter 5. He focuses on this one and said, do you want to get well? Do you want to be healed? Church, I believe that is a crucial question for us today. Where are there points in your life where you need to get well? Where are there points in this church where we need to be healed Where are we in terms of healing? But you know what I did? My mental health training mind started working. And I said, well, if this man had been in this condition for 38 years, could it be that this man suffered from anxiety? He was scared to get healed. He was afraid. You know how it is when we experience anxiety. Anxiety is a problem 
for all of us now, including me. We, we worry about things that we cannot control. Anxiety, I, I was talking with one of my pastor friends this week, and he told me, Glenn, I've been in ministry for over 40 years, but today I have anxiety. Every time I have to preach a sermon, I feel the anxiety gushing through my starting on Saturday night. This is a time of great stress. This is a time where people are on the verge of having a nervous breakdown. We're, we're living in a perilous time. Hello, somebody. I need you to go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 28, where we see in the scripture where Jesus tells us, don't worry about life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat and what your needs are and what you're going to wear. Is life more than food? There's another question. The body more than clothes? Stop worrying and talking about worry things. Just go to verse 33. Seek ye first what? The kingdom of God. Don't spend all of your energy worrying about things that you can't even control, things that you really have no discerning wealth over. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, if you can go there, verses 6 to 7, I love this verse where Paul is letting us know that worrying does not bring any good things. And so in 6 to 7, Paul says, And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind. You go to verse, verse 7 where he says, uh, uh, Do not be anxious. That's verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving and pre present your requests to God. Questions about health. Questions. Jesus asked this man a direct question. The question was, do you want to be healed? Now, it's interesting that the man doesn't answer the question. He goes into a world of excuses. He says, I don't have anybody to help me. And every time I try to get out of this situation, somebody else jumps ahead of me. That's really deep for me in my homiletical mind where I was thinking about this passage of where this man says, Lord, I want to be healed, but every time I try to be healed, somebody comes out to me. This is in John chapter 5, Iowa. If you go to verses, I think it's around verse 6 and 7, you will see these words. The man was not able to get out of, here, out of the pool. But Jesus said, here is how you can be healed. Here is how you can move from your stuckness. I don't know about you, but I don't like to feel stuck. That's not a good feeling. And there are some people who major in what I call stuck theology. There are some people who love to just be stuck. Love to wallow in the mud like a pig. Hello, somebody. There are people who just don't want to go anywhere. They want things to stay like it's always been. And Jesus is, oh my God, I feel my help coming on. Now. Jesus says, in order for you to be healed, you've got to get up. You got to get from one situation. You got to move. There's, there's motion that happens when you want to be healed. Hallelujah. There is something that requires you to move your body from one point to another. So Jesus told the man to get up. And not only get up, but pick up your mat and walk. <laughs> and walk petty church it's time for this church to walk 
Look who you have here. The great leader, Pastor Nicholas Johnson. It's time for this church to walk. I've been with you for a year as an interim, trying to help you navigate through decisive moments of ministry. And now God has called the new Joshua to lead this church. And God wants this church to walk and go places that you've never been before. Oh, and I know Nick is going to do it because he's a man of vision. He has ideas. But in order for Pastor Johnson to succeed, he's going to need folks surrounding him who wants to walk. Amen. He said, rise, get up. Take your pallet and walk. And what happened? It says the man was instantly healed. Oh, my God. There's something about when Jesus speaks to our conditions, Jesus gives us instant healing. You remember, Petty Church, I was knocked out with you for two months back earlier this year. But, yes. Praise God. Praise the Lord. All right, we got a witness out there. I didn't expect that one. We got a witness. We got a witness out here. It's time for us to come together. Oh, you see the vision. But as this man was healed, and I got to wrap it up here with my, my points that I'm trying to make. The scripture says, after the man was healed... There was not total excitement. There were those who wanted to know, how dare this man who'd been in this pool for 38 years to be healed? It's the Sabbath day. It's the Sabbath. And, And church, this Sabbath image to me represents the voices of churches. When, When people come for healing... We sometimes become more judgmental rather than embracing people with love. There's a whole lot of people that are coming in downtown Newark that you better get ready for. Hello, somebody. I've been with you for a year, and and I've been able to see this community surrounding Petty Church. This church is in the heart of a a transitional moment, and there there are going to be some people that are going to come to this church that's going to test your faith and test do you really love. All right. Woo. Lord, Samantha, let's give Samantha some hand claps. She's ready to preach today. Wow. I, wow. All right. Where was I? <laughs> the pastor. My point is in closing, closure is that we have to ask the right questions about health. We've got to learn how to ask the right questions about where Petty Church is moving towards. And and let me say this, and this is what I was trying to emphasize in my point. I I met a a gentleman who works in in the Holes Food Store down the street on Broad Street. He runs the Newark Mentor Program for the whole city. His name is Tom Stevens, and he said, you're the interim over there? I said, yeah. He said, well... Is there a new pastor coming? I said, yes. And he took me to a place that I shall never forget. He took me into the back area of this massive building. And he said, this is where the young college students hang out. I said, wow. He said, if you want your church to reach college students, you've got to have somebody over here to greet these students and let them know that Petty Churches is alive. And I thought, how the Holy Spirit orchestrated that moment to let me know as the interim and now passing the mantle to the the Joshua, Pastor Nicholas Johnson, that there are people who are coming into this community that we got to get ready for. There's no time for homophobia. Hello, somebody. 
Oh, first time Pastor Glenn has ever used the word homophobia. There's no time for homophobia where we look at people who are different from us. And because of our homophobic attitudes, we push them away and say we don't want them in the church. How dare you do that? The church belongs to everybody. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. Well, I got to finish, Nick. You know, I only got two more sermons. You know what else I found out from this text? Is that there are points in your life when you tell everybody else your problems. You tell other people your problems. But what I have found out in life is that telling people my problems can never resolve the true problem. Because there is somebody else who's greater. His name is Jesus. So sometimes when I'm working as a pastor or doing things in my life, I say, God, I've told everybody else. But it's now time for me to tell you. So the song says, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. So we end the sermon with this great hymn of the church. My question is, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? Oh my God. There's something about when you tell it to Jesus. (laughs) There's something about telling it to Jesus. So I want you to tell Jesus Whatever may be hurting you this morning, whatever burdens you brought to church this morning, I know somebody. We call him Dr. Jesus. Oh, do I have a witness out there? He's a doctor. He's a healer. His name is Jesus. And so as Carol is playing this beautiful music and we meditate, let us think about our lives. I must tell Jesus. Jesus, all of my trials, I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, in my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. Name number 430. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, passionate friend. Oh, yes, he is. But if I ask him, he, he will deliver. Makes of my troubles makes of my troubles quickly and in the chorus come on church i must tell g oh tell jesus i must tell g hallelujah i cannot bear oh i cannot bear these burdens oh my god i must tell jesus I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus.
Jesus. Oh, Carol, thank you. Tempted and tried. Tempted and tired. I. Do you need a great Savior? One who can help my. Oh, Samantha, we love you. We love you, sister. We love you. We love you, sister. I must tell Jesus, Jesus, he all my cares and sorrows will share. Come on, church. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Hallelujah. I must tell Jesus. I've got to tell Jesus. I cannot bear burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can, Jesus can help me, Jesus. Just the chorus one more time. I must tell Jesus, come on, let's sing this for Samantha Henderson. I must tell Jesus, oh, God is going to walk with your sister Samantha. Oh, yeah, we feel your pain. We feel it because we're all in pain. Oh, yeah. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help. Jesus. I want you to open your mouth and say praise the Lord. I want you to just lift your hands. Lift your hands. Use your bodies to praise him. Hallelujah. Amen.